Hey there, Knicks fans. How you doing? It's your boy, John of the Macri, with you for another edition of the Knicks Film School podcast. We are back to interspersing podcasts uh, in between uh, post-game live streams. So uh, from here on in, you can expect to have a new pod pop up on your stream uh, in between when there are post games popping up. So we have some content for you coming out almost every day of the week. Uh, And today is a good one because it is the triumphant return. It has been three months, four months since we had, not since we've shared uh, a, you know, some podcast microphones, but in in, a, in this specific format, which is, of course, the mailbag, Chris Percy Einan, how are you doing? I'm doing great. It has been a little bit, but I'm excited to be back. There's, there's no time like the start of the next season. Everyone gets to see everything through orange and blue tinted glasses, and it's allowed, and you can have some optimism and fun, and, you know, a little energy, a little buzz in there. I like. I have to say, the most pleasant surprise that I've had in quite a long time, um, it was after the most recent Pacers game. I thought there would be an unhealthy amount of negativity following that game, and it was actually pretty positive. People were like, "I'm feeling good." You know, I feel good about RJ. I feel good about Julius. I feel good about Brunson, even though we didn't have the best game. Not worried about what happened at the end, which I'm not either. Uh, so. Yeah, I like I like where things are at right now. I'll say that. Me too. I mean, it's looking like from the roster moves over the offseason and how we know this rotation is going to fold out that at least several, you know, young players will have existing roles in a real team, like not just, "Hey guys, go like do that basketball." You know, like, like there's like a real team idea here and these young guys are going to get to be a big part of it. It's integral to our development going forward and so are having the vets around that are going to help, you know, be the rest of those puzzle pieces for us and should be a gritty, fun, yeah. tough team this year. It should be gritty. It will be gritty. It should be fun. I think it will be fun. I think that the benefit of um, Thibodeau intentionally or otherwise just setting a blaze to everything within his first like two press conferences was that it got a lot of that energy, not out of the way, but like, It was like it came out in full force and then we played some games and it's like, oh, okay, this is just this is just a basketball team and guys are going to play and the guys look good. And, you know, we'll see what happens if they lose the first game and certain 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 players uh, maybe don't don't play as much. I hope that's not the case. Um, Both. I hope they don't lose. And I hope we're not talking about minutes totals after game one. But, uh, yeah, you know, one step at a time. Um, So do we have questions today? Maybe. (laughs) <laughs> we might have some. Uh, we'll, we'll I, I noticed a few questions. I will. I haven't not thought for one millisecond about how I'm going to answer the ones that I saw, but I think I saw like three questions that I think you're going to be you're going to pull. But just in full disclosure, ah, right, well, we'll see, won't we? we <laughs> I know one way to find out. Huh? Yes. So <laughs> let's shall we? You know. Um, listen, I, I have to start with this because uh, I think. It is a full circle moment for me here on these mailbags. Uh, oh my God. That's a big deal. Cause you've been doing them for three years and that coincides with how many years. Anyway, Jeremy E wants to know who the best player on the team is and why his name is RJ Barrett. Shout out to Jeremy. E. His energy towards RJ Barrett is unparalleled. I it I really genuinely do admire it, and it makes me makes me yearn for the days where I used to have such undying beliefs in a player, um, which I don't think I have um, for anyone anymore. I'm, I'm too old and too crotchety. Um, you know, I'll say this before the preseason started, and preseason should I should say at the outset, preseason if preseason is changing your opinions on anything, it's probably. It's probably not good. Um, Before preseason started, I was very, very, very steadfast in my belief that Jalen Brunson would be the best Nick, not only to start the year, but to end the year. I still think that, 
because and like I know he he's now had two down shooting games in a row. I don't really care. I didn't love some of the shot selection in, game, in the most recent game, but whatever. It's it's preseason. Um, but his ability to just hit, I mean, utterly ridiculous shots, <laughs> like shot after shot after shot, and make some of them look easy. And like he like you know I think Clyde kept saying he's leaving a lot of them short against Indiana. Like whatever. But for the most part. He is the shots he pulls out. But you know what? Then then again, you go back and you watch the film of RJ through these three games. He's shooting almost 50 percent from the field, including uh, what is he about 48 percent from deep. Uh, And like he's making tough shots. And I think for me, more more than the fact that he's making tough shots is the fact that there have been. I'm trying to think, can you remember any like really ugly attempts at the rim? I don't think. Has there been even one? If there, maybe there has, and I'm just forgetting it. No, no, they they are all guided, calculated, and uh, the process is good. The process, yeah. Is good. It, thank you. Yes, it, there hasn't been any of those where it felt like we got two or three a game last year, if if not more, in some games, um, where it was like, oh my god, RJ, what do you like th- that? You cannot shoot that there. Um, I don't feel like we've got any of those, and if maybe I'm forgetting one or two, but so. I'll say this to Jeremy. I think it's closer. I think it's closer than I would have said. I still have it as Brunson because I, I just, I have such respect for the shot making. Um, but like, look, I think he's closing the gap. And I think maybe by the, I would, I think I would be open to having a different answer by the end of the year. I'll say that. Yeah. You look at the other end of the court and the positions that both guys play just in terms of what this league values nowadays. And, uh, it's a conversation to say the least. It is a conversation. I want to see a little bit more consistency from RJ at said other end of the court. He has all the ability in the world to be a impactful defender there. Um, but man, even there, like Brunson, he's got so much dog in him. He's got, to see, he just, he's got some fight. Yeah. He's got, yeah, he's got all the fight in the world. He's a little football out there. Uh, you see, you see Tibbs bringing out a Rose even who's not some stalwart. Uh, but he he gets you know nippy at the point of attack. Yeah, a little little nippy. aggression there. I like that <laughs> nippy. <laughs> he does get nippy. Uh, that was a good question. Good question to start us off. All right. Well, you know, there's <laughs> there's not many places that you could go to to beat that question. But I know one person you could go to to, to who would have a question to beat that one, and it is the boss. Okay, R- Robert Cross. Pick. One Nick whose stock will rise the most this year and say why you asked to him. You never do this. You were as a clarifying question. You never do this. No, I don't. You you not only looked at his question, you asked a follow up and he gave you one. He said in terms of percentage of value, not my, just the dollar value of this. Stock. So my I was I'm very I was very clear in my follow up question. That was a good question. If one, if a player, like let's pr- pretend these players are stocks and one is a $20 stock and one is a $10 stock and they both go up by $10 or let's say one goes up by 10 and, and the, the, um, the, the $20 one goes up by 11, the, the lesser valued stock initially has increased much greater percentage wise, but it may not have increased as much dollar wise. And he, he wants to know percentage wise. So like who, takes the biggest leap from where they are at this point in time. Um, and I think it makes it for a very interesting question because I think you could argue like, you know, if Deuce f- was like the 11th man and appeared in 40 games and played like really, really well in those 40 games and like you could make an argument for him. I think it it opens the question up to a lot of possible answers, which I like. Um I and this is also a little bit of beauty in the eye of the beholder because I think, and this is the tough one, everybody has different valuations on these guys right now. So I will answer it for my personal valuations. Like, where do I, who do I think will go up the most? Which in and of itself is a flawed way to approach it because if I'm sitting here and being like, this guy is going to have a great year, doesn't that intru- like by definition make me? make me already higher on them. So like, this is a really tough question to answer. I'm overthinking this. Um, I'll go with Obi. 
I'll go with Obi because I think Obi around the league. Well, I, I will I will quote friend of the pod, Zach Lowe. Like, what is Obi Toppin? We need to know by the end of this year, what is Obi Toppin? What do the Knicks have in Obi Toppin? It's why he went on his little rant when he was um talking about the Knicks after the Donovan Mitchell trade. Like, Obi Toppin needs to get 25 minutes because the Knicks need to find out what they have in this guy. Every little bit he shows you, to me, it's like it's not proof in and of itself that this guy can be on the level of like some of the best finishing non center big men that we've seen over the last 15 or 20 years. Like I have some of them writing, you know, for Friday's newsletter, like the last, the last purely finishing big guy, you know, not, not purely finishing big guy, but like a guy who wasn't like an offensive fulcrum in terms of, you know, like the cats or the Jokic's or, you know, even like a LaMarcus Aldridge in his heyday, someone who's mostly known for their finishing that made an all-star team. I think you have to go back to Blake Griffin, like in exactly his rookie, the name, yeah. exactly the name that popped to my head was rookie year, Blake Griffin, rookie year, all-star team. rookie year, Blake Griffin, last rookie to, to make the all-star team. You yeah. know, maybe, maybe when Benyama or Scoot changes that, but as of right now, maybe Blake Griffin is still the last rookie to have made a real all-star team, not just the dunk contest. And before Blake, I think you have to go back to, a guy who a lot of people have already compared Obi to, and that's Stoudemire. And I think those are like your, I don't, you know, you want to say they're 99th percentile outcomes. You want to say they're 95th percentile outcomes. I mean, those dudes are borderline Hall of Famers. So I don't know. But the, I guess the point is what we see now from Obi, we can't say, oh, he's that. He's going to be that if he gets 35 minutes. We don't know that, but we know enough to be like, I want to see him get 35 minutes a night because I don't know. And we've seen enough to at least sit here and wonder and have that wondering not be ridiculous, which is why all of the calls for him to play more minutes at this point are just like, you, you, you can't argue against them. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm part of the, the chorus there. Um, unfortunately, it's, it's, it's not going to happen with the roster as, as currently constructed, but perhaps we'll get, Another another question on that, but to finish this point, I think even getting twenty minutes a night, which I do think he's going to get by hook or by crook, um, I think that's going to be enough for him to to solidify what he is for the most part uh, around the league. Fair one, you know. I I, I think he needs to play, uh, and that's that's an easy way to put it. Um, I think twenty minutes a game, if you want to talk a number. You, you want to put a number out there as, as a minimum. That's a minimum. Uh, yeah, minimum. I, I know. I know. Twenty five is is it very ambitious. Um, but I I took the time and did out a rotation of what two hundred forty minutes, and it I was found, good. I found twenty for Obi Toppin, and I'm still breathing. So you know, if they can't I, find twenty, if they can't find tw- and if there's not an organizational commitment to finding twenty, and like I've I've been thinking. So, I don't want. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you. I've been thinking so much about this, like. The, the priorities of winning versus the priorities of the development versus the priorities of figuring out what you have in these assets. Like we don't need to separate those things out with Obi because when Obi plays, good things happen. It's purely a matter of like Julius is here. Julius is on a hundred million dollar contract. When Julius is right, Julius plays well and helps the team. That's what it comes down to, you know, but they just, it has to, 20 at a minimum. I, I'm sorry, 20 at a minimum. That's the minimum. Yeah, that's that's more than fair. I think when when you're just looking at the investment they made in top and in regards of, to draft capital, yeah, there needs to be some sort of organizational urgency to see him on the floor. You saw it in play in his rookie season because Thibodeau would have given him zero minutes a game if he could have, and I I believe that. But he played ten pretty consistently, and it wasn't ten minutes a game. Like, hey, this guy gets in there and gives us ten minutes a game of high powered, high flying energy. It was like. This guy it gets his 10 minutes and he gets the hell out as soon as possible. Like this is, this is literally them saying if Obi plays less than 10 minutes, you're getting canned. And he had like Scott King with the laptop on the sideline with the timer going like nine, nine, nine 49, nine 50, nine 51, nine 52. You know, like this was, this was not some come, but it paid off. We heard from Berman now this past off season that that Thibodeau likes stopping now, you know, it took three years, but it happened. And, and if it happened, then let's see it. I d- d- very well said. And and I, the development curve for him from that first two thirds or so of his rookie year 
to the end of his rookie year where he really started to pop to the playoffs where Tibbs went to him with Randall. We talked about that recently when, he, when his back was against the wall to then last year starting off kind of a little iffy, but then quickly picking up steam and then finishing the way he finished. And now what we've seen just in these three games, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's not a flat development curve. Uh, it's, it's quite the opposite. Yeah, <laughs> that's fair. Um, I think something like last final quick note is that I feel like a lot of Thibodeau detractors try to say he's not good at player development. And then the Thibodeau fans are like, he is good at player development. The you here is the proof. And I'm like, Hey, why not both? Like what, what about he's actually really good at developing young talent and he's actually really bad at entrusting them and enabling them yeah. on the court to show those improvements. It's like, what, what if you guys are both right? <laughs> you know, like what, if people are yelling at each other, both saying true statements and being like, these are mutually exclusive. No, they're not. But they're actually that's the difference. True. That's the difference between your Thibodeaus and your Doc Rivers and your Mike Budenholzers and your, I'm trying to think of like, you know, if you want to throw Stan Van Gundy, like these, these guys are all on the, like when you add up total wins, when you add up winning percentage, when you add up like even playoff success, like these guys are all going to be considered by the time they're done, certainly within the top 50 coaches of all time, if not a little bit higher for certainly for some of them. But there's a reason why they have the reputation they do. And then you got guys like Spo and, you know, if you want to throw Brad Stevens in, uh, you know, to that too, when he's still coached, I know things got a little dicer towards the end and like, you know, pop and like the guys that there's no conversation about whether this, the, that like the coach has it in him to take risks, even Though it 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 seems to go against most coaches' nature to take risks, and Thibodeau is certainly within that category. Yeah, he has his tenets. Uh, <laughs> Those tenets, way to put it. Um, listen, <laughs> let's let's step away from Nick's Landia for just one question. Just oh, one, sure. one one zoomed out question. Altirad wants to know who your favorite five non Knicks are that are currently playing and there's a stipulation, but I'm not going to say it until you say the five players. I want to see if you name the person they said you're not allowed to name. <laughs> so I'm, I'm going to see if they can catch it. So my, my favorite in terms of who I like to watch the most. Yeah. Five favorite non Knicks currently playing in the NBA. And in terms of watching them play games currently, not their entire career is the. Yeah, sure. Who do I like watching? Well, I'm fairly certain that the player I'm not supposed to say is Taj. It's Taj Gibson. There's a shocker. <laughs> um, okay. Um, I know number one. You think it's going to be Luca? The future Michael Jordan? Yes, I think your number one is Luca. Let me help you. Your number one is Luca. I, I not. I was first of all, I was not asked to rank these. Um, so. <laughs> So one of the guys on the list is Luca. Yes. Yeah. Luca. Luca is on there. Okay. Um, he, he admits. I can see he's on my five too. Like real talk. I love watching Luca. I love Embiid. Oh. I just great, like Embiid. I like I like the way Embiid goes at uh, goes about his business. I mean, Curry is an obvious one. I'll I'll put him there. I don't know how anyone could not love watching Steph Curry. Um. Man, I might have had Donovan Mitchell on this list. <laughs> mm. I, I don't think I could do it right now. Never tell me that you like defense again. Don't ever tell me you you like watching defense. I know. I know. I don't, think, I don't want to hear it. Um, I like watching really good offense, though. Yeah, so do I. So that's why yeah. I, would have, I would have Trey <laughs> over Donovan. Okay, but one was available. No, I'm not picking Trey Young. <laughs> I'm not picking Trey Young. And I'm also. not picking Donovan Mitchell either. Yeah. Um, I, mm, man, I'm going with all, I'm going like so chalk here, uh, but I like, I'm going, I'm just being honest. Like there are quirky guys who it's fun to watch, like how they go about their business that are very different. But if it really comes down to who I like playing, all right, I need, I got to name two more. Um, I'm going to try to go a little bit outside the box here. You know, he's not there yet, but Anthony Edwards is going to be mm, there soon. 
Yep. It, it, Edwards is going to be there soon. And uh, I feel pretty, pretty confident in that. And then number five. It, this is not going to be a popular answer, but it, it, he, the way he goes about his business speaks to my ethos as a human being. Uh, I'll go Kawhi Leonard for my fifth. Oh, I thought you were going to say, I don't know. Something like Jared Dudley. Like, is that a, something? <laughs> oh my God, he's not even in the league anymore. <laughs> uh, uh, Taj would not have been on, on my list, sadly. Um, Chris, what about you? Oh, good good thing I was thinking about it in case you asked. I've got Book, Embiid, SGA. <laughs> um, and then... Oh, CAA clients, okay. After those three, I have Nikola Jokic, who's an absolute joy to watch play basketball. Yes. And... I would have to go. I'm really tempted to say Steph Curry, but me personally, I, I I'm gonna be weird and go Giannis over him because I just love the domination. Like that's part of MB too. Is like you see that guy out there hitting those shots and then blocking those shots. I was just like, oh, that's not supposed to happen. Like <laughs> that's 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 that can't be real. And then you're at MSG soaking it in. And I don't know. I, I I've gone to Nick Sixers ever since MB was drafted. I was there on Christmas when Ennis Cantor uh, 30 and 20 and we lost. How can we forget for, I forget there. That. His yeah. name I, is I Ennis know. Freedom. Oh sure it is. Um Giannis would be my sixth by the way. That's a good call on you. <laughs> <laughs> Next <a> up. <laughs> okay, Chris. <laughs> oh, we <laughs> Matt, the Aussie Nick fan, has a fantasy question. So now we're back in Nick's Landia. Oh my goodness. But we're in fantasy Nick's Landia. So you know, just preparing you for the multiverse of, of mailbag here. There's a lot of Landias here. Yeah, it's just a, it's a multiverse of mailbag. Just, you know, just, what else can I say? Which Nick? will lead the team and this is not asking which player will lead all four of these categories okay but we get four answers out of john here points and i a couple of them are real easy points assists rebounds and field goal percentage he has his fantasy nba draft on the weekend he's tossing up between brunson and rj to take as the nick who will be the you know statistical steady hand and he says he loves our work team so thank you matt for that yeah, uh, shout out to Matt. He's an uh, awesome Nick fan. Um, so wait, uh, this isn't really a fantasy question. This is just who do I think are the best Knicks who are going to be the top in those categories? Well, injury could play a role in this. It, it, you know, it's, it's got to be it's totals for the season, not per game. So points, assists, rebounds, and then. So I think RJ Barrett will score the most points. I think. Man, I've been throwing the assist thing. Will now has I've kind of been thrown for a loop. I um, I'm drinking the Julius Kool-Aid. I, no, I'll go, I'll, I, I'll, I manufacture the Julius Kool-Aid and I have <laughs> and I have Brunson. So let's, let's I'll go bro, I'll, I'll, I'll go I'll go truck. I'll go bro, it would it would be a hot take if I was like Julius will lead the team in assists. No, I'll go I'll go Brunson. Um we could just play that clip with like anim- like put in some rain effects and like dim the screen and just have his, <laughs> his assist total for the season of like 17 up on the on the screen at the end of the year. He, listen, uh, Julie's going to get a lot of assists. I believe that. But I think Brunson will get more rebounds. Um, that should be easy, Julius, right? What? Total rebounds for the year? Oh, because availability. Yeah. Julius. Okay, never mind. Per game was easy too, but I I had a different player in mind. Wait a minute. What what is Mitch? What is Mitch re, uh, rebound average per game? When he plays actual minutes, which you're hoping he can this year if he shows up in shape. Because uh, I feel like he gives double. up. I feel like he has a lot of those nights like the other night where he had six offensive rebounds and two defensive rebounds. Because like he does do that, but in his career, in the four years, he averaged six and a half, seven, eight, and then eight and a half. So you'd think. Yeah, but that's 20, still Julius averaged nine point nine last year. And how many minutes? So, but it, it's a Mitch played less than twenty six minutes a game. And yeah, but I'm picking totals here, right? But now this season, if you're thinking Mitch plays thirty a game instead of twenty five or twenty six, do not think up. Mitchell Robinson will play thirty minutes a game. I think Mitchell Robinson you think will Hardenstein's play. Hardenstein's getting twenty five plus. Oh no, I think now, now we're getting hot. <laughs> no, I think Hardenstein plays a Hardenstein. I think plays at least twenty. Hard, excuse me. Harden Stein. Did I get it right? 
Thank you, Andrew. There it is. Hardenstein will play uh, at, uh, over 20 minutes, which means I think Mitch will play under 30, but I think he'll play more than 25. Um, anyway, we're far afoul of the question. No, I, I'm, I'll go Julius for rebounds. And then the last one is field goal percentage. You want to think we'll have the highest field goal percentage on the Knicks? Yeah. I, I don't know if the, Mitch. Yeah. 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 Obviously. Between, Can I just say RJ who I think Brunson. will be the best fantasy player on the Knicks? Okay. Oh, because if I recall correctly, and I should look up this because I'm going to be in a fantasy league again. Uh, I God, I'm terrible at fantasy basketball. But like your percentages matter quite a bit, right? It depends on your league scoring, but like standard scoring, a lot of yeah. Leagues, what's so? You, give me standard get, scoring: it's points, rebounds, assists. Yeah, you you get penalized. I think for every miss. So oh, it's a it's a deal and a big one. You know what I I. Man. Oh my God. I can't believe I'm going to say this out loud. You think I, it's be Randall. I, I think it might be Randall. I think yes. Randall might be the best fantasy player on the Knicks. <laughs> hey, the banner. <laughs> I already have it. I'm looking at it. It's on the other side of the room. I never took it down. Hey, this Chris, remember there. the beginning of this pod where John said it's preseason. Let's not overreact. <laughs> Now Julius Randle is going to be the best Pepperidge, fantasy player in the league. Pepperidge, Hold on, on, I on said the Knicks on the on Knicks. Knicks Far- Pepperidge Farm remembers. Uh huh. Said not so for <laughs> No, but he played as bad as a a, a high high volume player can play last year, and he mm-hmm. still averaged twenty ten and five. And we still won thirty seven games. I don't even care about the per point the, the per game averages. We won thirty seven games with the guy who had the ball most and who did the most with it being genuinely terrible. So like people projecting us to win like 35 this year because ha ha LOL no. Knicks are that's I don't a, think there's a lot whole of, different conversation. Yeah, it's a whole different conversation. Regression but to no, the but, mean for Randall is more than But if Randall part. puts up if Randall puts up 18 10 and 5 or 18 10 and 4 and a half he doesn't get you steals and he doesn't get you blocks. So that hurts, but it really just comes down to the percentages with him because Brunson super optimistically I think um like 18, 17, 18, maybe 19 plus seven assists would be a ton. And like, he gets a lot of rebounds, but even like, what's a lot of rebounds for a six foot tall guard, like f- four and a half, five. I like, so it, his percentages are going to be better than Randall's for sure. But like how much better? I don't know. I think that, I think it'll be between those two, but I think RJ will be, it wouldn't shock me if it was RJ. I think all those guys will be, be heard from, but I would go, I would go Randall. Man. Yeah. All wild, right. wild, wacky stuff that is on tape now. Um, <laughs> that, that's not getting deleted. No. Uh, and it certainly will not be getting reposted this April. Andrew, do not set a reminder in the calendar to remember that that clip. You better set a reminder if I if it turns out to be right and correct. Uh, you all have to remember then. That sounds like it's on you. I we'll put it on TikTok. John's on there all the time. <laughs> That's what we'll do. <laughs> That's the one I'll go on TikTok. Just put it on TikTok. Definitely. Why don't you guys ever post what I'm right? John, we they're on TikTok all the time. Definitely <laughs> downloaded that application <laughs> on the old the iPhone. Tiki Tock. The yes. old tickety tickety talk. Uh next question, please. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> All right. I'm glad we're in silly season for this question because it is, I'm asking it and in, in, in what are we not in silly season? <laughs> um, I'm glad we are, you know, officially uh, it's just Stacy Patton wants to know why Emmanuel quickly isn't a real point guard. And to the, to the rhyme and rhythm of, of Mr. Uh, Tommy T, he asked you to please include film and data. <laughs> um, <laughs> that was the driest fake laugh ever. <laughs> I think, I think, I think. Um, look, it was a preseason game, but it was. I'd be lying if I said it was. It was not slightly disconcerting that the offense was was so bad um, against a bunch of guys who are, with the exception of. Um, uh, Matherin and I guess maybe O'Shea Brissett was he even out there at the end of the game, but like whatever it was, it was Matherin and a couple of Duarte, guys that I know for sure Duarte, are not. Gonna... Was he? Oh, was Duarte out there at the end too? Okay. Turn, well, Turner, Turner was. So I don't. 
was yeah. No, Bataze was out there at the end. Oh, that's right. Yeah. The, the, yeah. The, the, Bataze the, both, both and teams went young at the end. That's right. Yes. But the Pacers went young with guys that are not going to be even getting minutes for their tanking team. Like, I, I think <laughs> this is why this is such a stupid conversation. It's because can, can Emmanuel, can you put Emmanuel quickly at the nominal point guard position in certain lineups with certain guys who could do certain things and have him be absolutely fine. Yes. 1000%. But because this, the reason this question has continues to make the rounds and is because there is no right answer to it, which is because there is no set definition to what is a point guard in the NBA today, nor has there been a set definition for what a point guard of the NBA is today since I don't know. John Stockton hung up his uh, his short shorts. I I don't you probably even you could even go before that because like okay, Magic Johnson was a point guard, right? He didn't look anything like other, you know, traditional point guards and like Isaiah Thomas was was uh not maybe as as voluminous as as Allen Iverson, but they had a lot of Iverson shit before Iverson came in and did that stuff. So it's like there's been different definitions of point guards for a long time. The league because the rules have changed and because the have the, how the sport has evolved, the only the biggest difference is that typically speaking, point guards like the guy who has the ball in their hands is the one who is oftentimes the most talented offensive initiator. Whereas for many, many years, that did not necessarily need it to be the case. Your point guard could just like set up the offense and someone else could initiate the offense, whether it was Carl Malone or David Robinson or Patrick Ewing, wherever the fuck that that has largely changed now, which is why, you know, Jalen Brunson as the 15th or 16th or 14th, whatever best point guard in the league is getting paid a hundred billion dollars. And nobody's no smart person says boo about it because it's like, yeah, of course, that's what he should be getting paid. This is a very, very long winded way of saying last night or as we're recording this last night, when quickly played the Pacers, his role as a point guard in that situation was to initiate the offense and be the engine. And he struggled to do that because the balance between taking his own shot and trying to get other shots was not really there. And that's partially because he still doesn't have that ability to break guys down in a way that a Brunson does or like a Donovan Mitchell would have. Yeah. That's not, it doesn't, doesn't help when he's, you know, missing shots too, that he, that we know he usually, of course, like the floor, like, that's one thing we know he has. It just wasn't following. Yeah. So it's, it's, it really didn't look great on the stat sheet. But how do you, but how does that factor into this conversation? The is he a point guard conversation? Because I guarantee you, if Emmanuel quickly had been out there at the end of the game with whoever, RJ Brunson, like better players, his role in that situation, actually, no, take Brunson off, put other better players. So Brunson so quickly is the point guard, right? The nominal point guard, his role changes there. And I bet you he would have looked a lot better and he would have been much more successful in, in that endeavor than he was. So th- again, this is such a ridiculous conversation. You know, is Emmanuel quickly Chris Paul? No, he's not Chris Paul, but like, can he run the show in a lot of spots? Absolutely. But it's, I think it's fair to acknowledge that he has shortcomings just like, you know, all, but like a handful of players do in the league. Yeah. You know, I think positions just obviously matter, but like that, what we think of positions, like doesn't like it, it, the NBA coaches see it a lot differently than uh, point guard, shooting guard. You have your ball handlers, you have your wings, you have your bigs. That's how they talk about this stuff. And, yeah. You know, quick, He's a ball handler. Uh, Tibbs likes to have him out there with another ball handler in rows but together. They're pretty but, electric. That's cool for us. Let's let's work with it. You know, I, I think that's how to discuss this. I, I think that what, what people get stuck in with quickly is the constant discourse being about what he can't do or what he can almost do or what like what he can do right now is be good. He can be a positive on both ends of the floor in a season where everything went to shit. Yeah. A season where the guy who had the ball more than anyone else had piss running down his legs every time he brought the ball up the court. So if you can be the only player on the team to be a positive on both ends of the court, the only player on the team to be a positive in two man pairings with that player and the only player on the team to, you know, have as much of a positive wingspan as he does with the shooting prowess that he does with the defensive instincts that he's shown with the synergy he's shown with our other important 
important young players. It's like, there are so many fun things about Emmanuel quickly that we could spend so much time if you're enjoying. Yeah. People are like, yeah, but what if, what if he doesn't drive left that much? It's like, he's driven left like eight times this preseason. Like he's working. Look, if you it. don't he's like 22, let's cool. Let's, let's relax. If you don't you know, enjoy, if you don't enjoy watching Emmanuel quickly play, then something's wrong with you. He is the Nick that has provided me with the most joy. I'm not even sure it's close. There's like a oh, selfish I, label that's like really popular to stick on him from. Well, that's from, stupid. And it's just like, um, like, why? But like, again, that, it gets back to the role question. Emmanuel Quickly's role for two years has been to come in and to shoot the ball. That is what he's supposed to do. Now, I know he hasn't made as many shots as he would like to do as, as to make. And as, as I'm sure the Knicks would like him to make doesn't mean he's been bad because guess what? The shots that he hits oftentimes are huge. And the threat of his shooting is a defense bender. The last thing I'll say on quickly is the notion to me, and you may disagree. And there are maybe people who listen to this that may also disagree, but the notion like, you know, Hollinger wrote his thing the other day that quickly might top out as a third guard on a contender. And I think a lot of people took that as a slight. And I'm thinking to myself, like, if you're a third guard on a contender in the NBA today, you're making at least $15 million a year, probably more than that, especially with the cap rising, like within a season or two, third guards on contenders are going to be on a five-year contract, nine figure players to, to call someone a third guard and a contender when guys like, you know, Jason Terry have been a third guard on a contender or, or a team that has like one and like guys of that ilk over the, you know, I mean, manage Nobi, that's a bit of a stretch, but like, that's a massively valuable role in a guards league. If that's what Emmanuel quickly is, I like that's not a slight to me. If he's a six man and he's still playing, you know, over 25 minutes a game and playing massive minutes and big, a big role. That's all I just want to say at the end. There. Yeah. I, I think, you know, we could be talking about um, how, the Knicks, like, all right. Instead of talking about what quickly himself can't do, we could spend like way more productive time talking about what the Knicks have done instead of quickly, like why we don't know yeah. what quickly is. Like, well, and that Alfred was ridiculous. Payton. It was Alfred year. Payton. It was it was EP, and then it was the corpse of KW, and then it was AB. Yes. And at that point, I, when it when it got not to even AB, saying their names, just initials. When it got, and I like Burks, so he can he can get a shout. But but when it got to Burks, right. That's when you knew that it was like, no matter what happens, yeah. this kid's not getting a shot because they see him happen. in this role, you know, and that and that is what I what I personally was most aggrieved by last season. It's and, fine for them to see him in, in any way they want, but but to limit to them themselves well, to what they see is just uh, I don't know. I, 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 don't. I tend to read articles from different publications or places and see like you know different perspectives, like just see what what else is going on? You know, even if I think it's crazy, just get a, get a look into what's going on. And I, I do not shot, disagree, especially if I have nothing better to do, you know, especially if I'm blowing 10 games straight on the backs of <laughs> 35 year olds, uh, you know, I don't, I'm not disagreeing with the way she goes. <laughs> uh, next up. Yeah, this is a, this is a fun one. Um, and this one is, is the kind of basketball discourse that I, I very much enjoy, uh, which star player, Andrew asks, not our producer. Not Andrew. Do you Claudia? think would fit best on the current Knicks roster? Not worrying about how realistic getting them would be. Joel Embiid. Um, wow, that's the that, easiest that, question. That, that much faster me. than than Curry, or is Curry just like <laughs> off limits because it's a cheat code and any team could use him? Hey, what's the question? Best what? star player fit on the Knicks right now with their current roster. Not worrying their current about roster. whether the acquisition would be realistic. Like it was like a tenet of the question to not concern yourself with realism. Just who's the best basketball fit on a clipboard. So we're taking one player off of any team and not yeah. taking anybody off the Knicks. You're dropping, you're, you're dropping Jeez. them in. My rationale for Embiid over, uh, let's say Giannis or Luca, who I obviously think are better players than Embiid. And I think you probably throw Curry in there too. Um, are I think I don't have to think about anything with Embiid because I'm literally just and I like Mitch. And Mitch has been, I wrote today, Mitch has been their most consistent player, I think, through three preseason games. I think he's gonna have a really good year. Um, very high on Mitchell Robinson right now and moving forward. But Mitchell Robinson, God love him, is 
there are things that he, he is in his wildest dreams. Actually, no, in practice courts and in, in wherever he lives in, in Louisiana. Uh, my God, I'm forgetting the name of the town that he's from. Uh, starts with a C. Anyway, like he does that shit there. Um, he's never doing it on an NBA court. Joel Embiid does that stuff on an NBA court. And just it's, it's just as simple as taking Mitch off and putting Embiid in. And I think everything else could stay the same. The fit with Randall's a little clunky, but you could literally say that about any player you put onto the Knicks roster aside from, I guess towns because towns is more of a shooter than Embiid. but I don't, I'm not spoiler alert, I'm not taking towns over to Joel Embiid. Um, Whoa. so, <laughs> so yeah. And then with, with Luca, with Giannis, it's like, those are, you know, those are obviously ball dominant guys. So is Embiid, but it's like, okay, if you, if you bring in those guys into the picture, what does that do? You know, what does that mean for RJ? I guess for Luca and, and Giannis, I, I guess it would be fine. Um, Can I give an answer that might be controversial? Sure. Kevin Durant. Because <laughs> then is he healthy? That's the, I mean, it's a big question for health purposes, but I'm thinking of he would need to be able to space the floor. He'd be fine off ball and then create when he needs to. And that's, that's something Kevin Durant would be able to do if he's healthy. How about agreed completely with your logic, but I raise you the guy in Kawhi Leonard who can play the other end of the ball. Oh, that's, that's a good one. That's a good one too. Yeah. That's a good one. So yeah, like that, that's what I'm thinking of. A three that would push RJ to the two. Hmm. Which is where if Chris wants to come in with his Devin Booker agenda, I don't <laughs> disagree. You know what? Can I change my answer? <laughs> yeah, what's up? Let's, let's hear it. I'm, I'm going, I agree with Chris. Kawhi. Kawhi. Okay. I'm change my answer to Kawhi. RJ and Kawhi. Like if I, I don't know, like me personally, if I was an NBA player who knew I had like 30 minutes ahead of defense to play and I knew that it had to be against those two specifically built guys and I also had to try to score on them, I, I would just like, I'd be, a, I'd be not nice to talk to all morning. Like I'd just be cranky all day thinking about having to get bumped by those guys for 30, 35 well, minutes. And I know. I know this wasn't the question, but like which version of the Knicks is better? Joel in place for Mitch. Everything else stays the same. Giannis in place of Randall. Everything else stays the same. That one. <laughs> that one. <laughs> yes, that one. <laughs> Man, but it's I stopped Giannis. listening at in place of Randall. Sorry. It's, it's Giannis plus shooting. It's always been Giannis plus shooting. Yeah. It was always Giannis plus shoot. <laughs> and there's not, it's, that's not really Giannis plus shooting. If you, I mean, listen, I hope the RJ shot is real and, you know, that continues. But um, certainly you're, if you're playing him alongside a traditional five, maybe you're starting Harden, Harden, Hardenstein there. Hardenstein, yeah. I would be remiss if I didn't mention you brought up injury concerns with Kevin Durant and Kawhi has missed that's true. two of the last four full seasons. Yeah, but four, no, five full seasons. Have you seen? Have you seen him since like the? What are we like doing? The, not overreacting the, the preseason, Chris. No, no, no. I'm talking about the off season. Like, uh -huh. you, you want to you want something worse to overreact to? <laughs> like we're not overreacting to videos at that gym that everybody plays at, Chris. Off season workout videos. Uh -huh. uh, his just it hit like I, I'm I'm gonna be weird. Like just like the quads. Like he's looking great. He's looking sturdy. This like Ooh, Kawhi. Tree, yeah, he's got tree trunks there now. I I just. Yeah, I, I trust that body to hold up. Now, I think that's what he spent this last year getting ready for. It was like, hey, I'm clearly entering this final. You know, I'm still at the peak, but I'm I'm on that second half of that bell curve and not the first. And I am I am heading down from here, not up, and I am going to get ready for it. He looks physically ready to sustain play. And, and mm -hmm. that's like something I've been looking for him since the end of his San Antonio tenure. And I love Kawhi and he has not given us that. And he finally now looks like he's built to play 82 games in the style that he likes to play. Man, so I'm just, he I'm, he ain't playing no 82 games. Chris. I know I'm <laughs> he's, he's not playing 62 Eight, games. 82 yeah. minus X, X yeah. equals back to back to back divided by two minus I'm just y, thinking, which is, <laughs> I'm just thinking of like, replace Evan Fournier with Kawhi Leonard. That's in the, next the thing lineup. is if we're replacing someone with Fournier, the answer probably just isn't wrong. You know? I mean, if it's the right guy, uh, Jason Tatum instead of Fournier, the Knicks are better. 
Jalen Brown instead of Fournier. The well, Knicks are better. Okay, we like, that's go, why the, the look, there's a long, there's a long instead way. of Fournier. John, Quentin Grimes instead of Fournier. The Knicks are better. Like that's why the Come on. Let's don't not tell, turn this. Don't tell well, John's Fournier coach. Hate. John's Fine. coach. That's funny. You know, like Quentin Grimes is hurt, right? Yeah, I I do. Like that to me is more why Evan you do Fournier realize starting. You do realize I, there's nobody that Tom Thibodeau loves more in that locker room. I think Grimes Grimes. is starting game. I've been saying Grimes is starting game one for like a minute. And then Begley came out and said the thing where he was like, even though he's hurt, he will have every chance to compete. But no, can we, can we divert for not? Okay. 30 second diversion. What is, if uh, can we all agree that Tom Thibodeau is absolutely a biggest fan of Quentin Grimes as we can imagine. I think the reason that Grimes was untouchable in any Donovan Mitchell trade is because he was said so. He Thibodeau said the other day, Grimes was head and shoulders from everybody else in terms of work ethic. He mm-hmm. would not say that unless he was absolutely head head over heels in love with this. Uh, that's, kid. A, that's a ludicrous thing to say if you're a coach. Like I don't, I, I, I'm not saying it's bad. I'm saying like for Thibodeau to say that for Thibodeau like to say he it. here's the point. He loves this kid. If he doesn't start him, and we know that he thinks he's awesome, and we also I think could be pretty sure that we know t- Fournier is not his cup of tea. I think that. I think we may be able to learn something about, I'm not saying it makes him a better coach or a worse coach or whatever, but I think it'll be introspective for us to look at like, okay, you know, why, did, why does he make the decisions that he makes? I had someone who I respect their opinion a lot and who may know a thing or two speculate, speculate to me earlier today that he continues to bring quickly off the bench because he loves quickly and wants to minimize his weaknesses, which is like, so he can take care, take advantage of backups. Yeah, which is an interesting yeah. theory. Hmm. You, know, you may think it's nuts, but uh, that, that's what I think we should be doing with Fournier is like, hey, this guy is like you watch France, you watch whoever this guy when he works north to south is li- like he looks like me out there. Like he dribbles off his knee. He, he dribbles off his shoes. Uh, OK, that was a detriment. Off. Good. <laughs> Hold on. I thought you were going like the NBA player looks like me. And I was like, where are we going? Not, oh, okay. We're not You're talking about Luca. Come on. Um, okay. L- l- listen, um, <laughs> I had to. Sorry. Basically, you. When, when Fournier works north south, it's abysmal. When he works west east, when he can get those just two to three lateral dribbles in, boom, boom, pull up. Yeah. He leverages his weight. He's really good at shifting it. His handle is optimized for that kind of usage. And Tibbs was like, you're going to sit in the corner and be Reggie Bullock. Well, or I'm going to be pissed. And it was like, okay, you know, so uh, um, I, I think if you get him off the bench, that's what I wanted to do last year was I wanted to start IQ and Burks together, both of them, not one or the other. And I wanted Rose and Fournier getting Evan. Well, listen, right you might, you might bench. get your worst this year. We'll I, I think, I think yeah. it will go well when it happens. Game one. Yeah. Johnny Bryant might have uh, some few tricks up his sleeve. Yeah. You know? <laughs> Next, next question, please. Yeah, I, was I just wanted to wrap this gone. up. We had all these star questions. None of us said the two-time MVP would be great on the next. Like, you just, just such an afterthought around the league. And yeah, no, I uh, mean, he's not an afterthought, but he's like, we you, have a center that exists and Evan Fournier starts for the team. But the so point that was, that was when we were doing was. the replace X with Y, Y, like, because I'm always going to take and beat. I'm always going to take and beat over Jokic. That's just me. Except when we talked about MVP last year. That's different. That's who deserved to win that award. That's not who I would take if I was starting my theoretical team. Okay. Different questions. Fair enough. Different questions. Chris, you're up. With the next question? Yes. Oh. That was that was a joke because we spent like six minutes meandering. But it's fun. It's fun to meander. It's good. It's how enjoy meandering. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Who's the better fit in the rotation as of right now? Between these two players, asks Trippy OG, Deuce McBride, Cam Reddish. You could have named any player as the first name, and it would have been the answer that I would have given instead of Cam Reddish. With Jalen Brunson, Emmanuel Quickly, oh, okay. Derek Rose, I didn't know Evan Fournier, and Quentin Grimes all on the roster, you're taking a guard over a wing? Well, no, I don't think either of those players are a member of the Knicks rotation, but like if today you had to swap someone out, 
would it not be Evan for for Cam? If you had if you had to. Oh, play, wait, no, hold on. This, the, the question keeps changing. I have to swap someone out. Nah, for- who, who's the better fit in the rotation as of right now? Deuce or Cam? Which means if you had to play one of them today, who would you rather put in? Who would you, who'd you rather insert? Deuce. All right. Absolutely. It's so you, you'd rather give up Rose minutes and, and to play Deuce than give up 48 minutes to play Reddish? I mean, we've seen him play. First of all, I, again, I don't think either of these guys are getting minutes in the rotation. But again, if I have to, re- so I'm replacing someone so I could replace. Yeah. It, the, the question is acknowledging neither are. It just wants to know out of the two, which one's the better fit. I don't know how Cam fits on this team right now, given how he has played. I, I just, he seems to be playing for a different basketball coach because there's nine, there's 10, you know, or four guys out there when he's not out, there's five guys out there who like, they may not be playing well, but they are clearly, there is a, there is a plan in place for how they go about their business at both ends of the court. And cam seems to not be a part of that plan at all Um, with the shots that he takes with his lack of effort uh, occasionally on defense. Like I get, (laughs) I get it. He can do things that nobody else on the next could do. I get it. Great. Good for him. Um, and guess what? Deuce McBride, you know what he can't do right now is hit a shot with any modicum of consistency. And that is incredibly frustrating, um, especially for a guard to not be able to like do like execute basic offensive shit. I would still take Deuce because I know what Deuce gives me at one end of the floor and it's valuable. Like it's absolutely valuable and I can make that work. Um, I don't want to lose Derek Rose. So I would just swap out Deuce for Fournier, I guess. Start Grimes, okay. bring well, Deuce, Deuce off the bench and do a three guard, do a three guard lineup against backups. Deuce was a better small forward in the preseason than than Cam was. So that that'd work. I yeah, the answer is Deuce. Because Tibbs did play Deuce at the three, and it did go better than than Cam's minutes there did. Which well, is- like it, if the goal is to win games. I'm not going to say this out loud. I heard we and have a coach. I heard we had a coach that likes doing that, John. Winning, winning those games. I mean, you knew correctly. You heard correctly. Like, Daquan Jeffries is a wing. Isn't Daquan Jeffries on the roster? You're a sick man. You're, you're pretty good in summer league. Uh, you're, you're, there's something wrong. <laughs> this is an over cam argument? <laughs> or yeah. a, you're a sick man. <laughs> He's man. looked like an atrocity against basketball. He has. He has. I I think and he this, thinks he is destined for stardom. This, this, what, in what world does this end well? I could blow this up really right now by saying that this is what the Nick fans thought Frank Villacino was. <laughs> Just light ablaze everything ever. <laughs> no, <laughs> that, but like, like the, the, I, at least I, he brought defense, right? Like Right, <laughs> who Frank? Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. He did. He's getting tabbed to be the backup point guard of a good team this year. That should be interesting. I want to see. Reddish. How anyway, let's 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 move on. I, I'm the, I don't want to trash Cam. Oh, listen, Frank 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 is Dallas's backup point guard, and Cam is the New York Knicks' eleventh man. So that's that's where things are right now. I don't think he's going to be the eleventh man <laughs> come come the regular season. <laughs> say that. Yeah, no, you you have not seen him here for long for long. Um, yeah. All right. This one, I, I, I challenge you to speed run it. Not because I, I want you to mess up. Like I want you to say something that, that we can go clip in a year. Oh, goodness. So, so okay. don't take your time. Jordan Bub wants to know what are the top five Knicks trade assets coming into the regular season? Oh, goodness. And if you can rank them from most so that, valuable to least. So just to be clear, is anything off limits or is basically everything the Knicks possess is a no, trade asset? What the Knicks got on them. Okay, great. So RJ Barrett is number one. Number one. Number one. Mm-hmm. Ahead of Brunson. Uh, two is ahead, interesting. Ahead of stock at MSG. Ahead of stock at MSG. Uh, two is interesting. There are a lot of different directions I go with two. Um, hmm. I wonder if, if, if how many teams in the league if given the option of an, an unprotected 2029 New York Knicks draft pick or Jalen Brunson at his current contract, 
It's descending. So I'm pretty sure you'd get it. It's descending, it but like more than several bites on, on the, the, but there is a, there is still a question. Like I think uh, for a lot of contending teams, Jalen Brunson's a six man, right? So would you rather trade for a six man or would you rather trade for the chance that whatever fucking, you know, 12 year old out there is going to be the next Victor women. Well, it's a bad example. going to be the next Scoot Henderson because Victor woman. Yana doesn't, doesn't come around very often. Speaking of Victor, why wouldn't the 2023 pick be? Because I think, I think that's going to be good. Right. But in this hypothetical, wouldn't a team rather take a shot that given the next track record of the last, Oh, that's a really years, interesting one. It like that, if you're doing your, if you're doing your projections internally and like, okay, we think that there is a, 35% chance the Knicks are in the lottery. Yeah. And we think that there is a 4% chance or a 5% chance they end up with the well, maybe it wouldn't even be that high. I don't think. Whatever. Let's say a team was like, we think there's a 5% chance that the Knicks end up with the top pick mm-hmm. based on our internal statistical models. Right. Would not their unprotected 2023 pick with a 5% chance at number one, and let's say a 5% chance at number two, would that not be, huh? That's why I'm I'm trying to do the calculations here. Wouldn't a 5% chance of Victor Wembanyama? Because none of us, that's a I don't really think good none question. of us have the Knicks in the playoffs. They are, they're at least the play-in, yeah. and we'll see what happens. So should they lose in the play-in? It's a 9 or 10 seed. They're in the this, lottery. This, this is the so you're telling me there's a chance. Yeah, uh, but wouldn't you yeah. rather tell me there's a chance of Victor Wembanyama than will Jalen Brunson be better than you know what his contract is Man. right now? I think this draft and the players potentially available at the top make. I'd argue it's and this is where I'll get in trouble. I'd argue it's closer two to one. The next 2023 pick. What do you mean to closer? And to- RJ and RJ. Oh, you think it's, that's not a, a knock on RJ. I think he is the Knicks number one asset right now. It, I just he, he from the RJ guy. He just signed an extension that now has his value at a legitimate unknown. Like we mm-hmm. do not know what that extension like. We don't know how it'll age. We know. Right. All right. Those, so, you know, so I'm not going to sit here and be like, <laughs> damn you for not thinking RJ Barrett's a pot of gold is like, no, like he he got cashed out. Like what I was trying to prove about him has been proven by the fact that he received $120 million well, on the market. One oh six. I'll go. Just thank you, Jeremy. <laughs> shoe. Shoe. I'm I'll, sorry. Right. No, ruined I, Andrew, you know what? You, you convince me. I will go RJ one 2023 first unprotected number. is the number two 2029 unprotected number three 2028 unprotected number four. And 2027, I'm protected number five. So this is what our, what we value, right? Not what we think the Knicks value. This is what I think other teams around the league would. If, 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 other, if 29 teams got together and congregated and we say mm-hmm. we have to come up together with a list of the Knicks top five trade assets, I think, I think this is what it would be. Chris, what do you have? I've got RJ1. I, I would go with that that 23 pick at two, I think because right now the sentiment seems to be like, you know what people say about stocks? Like, Oh, if everyone thinks the market's going up, it's going up. If everyone thinks it's going down, it's going down. Like public perception really does matter. I Mm -hmm. think the, the public perception in terms of the 30 GMs or the 29 other ones is that, you need a slice of the pie of this 2023 draft. Yeah. So I would think I totally agree with you there on the value of that pick. Um, you know, I know I'm, you know, crazy for him and 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 his. Oh man, off, here it off comes ball, off ball ability. But I I would go Obi. Uh, whoa, whoa! I hear was it he my number two or something when we first he was six, your number two. two ago? I would go right? Obi high here, and and the reason is teams are just seeing more and more that he's being fed crumbs and turning them into to gourmet dinners. I mean, they, they, like he's getting literal crumbs from Thibodeau and he's made something of it every time and besides his rookie season, the start of it. Oh no. You know? So I don't, he, he had a huge role change. He's adapted. He is now Obi Toppin NBA high flyer. Uh, he's a big connector. And I think that's really valuable teams. You know, maybe a team like the Pacers, maybe guys with the teams that have ball handlers that they like, 
could really use someone who doesn't need the ball to contribute. Uh, All right. I, that, there's uh, your argument for, for I'll give you a, over. okay. I'll give you a hot take. And I, I love Obi Toppin. Love Obi Toppin. I think there's a chance he doesn't end up on the top 10 of this list. Cause you like got, long, you got like long term or no, if or we right did now. this list out to 10, cause you got RJ, you have seven unprotected Knicks picks. And then, so that's eight assets. Um, there he is at nine. What what's worth Brunson, quickly and Brunson. Brun, gr, gr, Grimes and Brunson. Grimes, Grimes and Brunson. The guy that Grimes has the extra year of rookie control, right? Yeah. Yes. Okay, that'll do it. So I'll go OB three, Grimes four. Give me one of the other one of the other picks or, or Brunson five. I don't I don't care. Okay. I do whatever whatever a team will think. I, it's all it's so circumstantial with like their needs. But you know, like like a team like Houston is not going to be banging the door down for Jalen Brunson. It just doesn't make sense right now. You're absolutely um, right. Yeah. But, and I, yeah. and I, but it's here's the thing. There's bad teams that aren't banging the door down for Jalen Brunson. And there's really great teams that are not banging the door down for Jalen Brunson. Meanwhile, Who, the Milwaukee Bucks would probably kill for him because they could, uh, you know, Brunson, I don't know about the Bucks at the, you know, Brunson, who would kill for him. The, Brunson, the fucking Drew. Lakers would kill for him. Well, the Lakers would kill to have you out there, John. So I don't know <laughs> about that. Uh, next, next question. They'd love to have Taylor Horton Tucker back. I bet they're so relieved internally that they can stop. <laughs> that's just over um yeah all right the last question is forcing you to to whip out the crystal ball but this time you have to shake it up a bunch before you look into it we're getting crazy who better to bring in for this than ray marcano hey he says here's a tough one every season has a holy shit i didn't see that coming moment rose trade jericho coming out of nowhere to contribute what will be this season's holy shit moment? Mm. Talk about Julius Randle leading the team in fantasy points. Talk, that is not going to be a holy shit moment. Um, <laughs> man. Hold on. Give me, I need a second to think about this one. Do you have a, an answer at the top of your head? For me? Yeah, your um, answer. I I think that it would be a game. I think this is this is oh. the kind of season where like do you remember that year that we put up like 54 and a quarter against Toronto what and is had what? like the biggest color balancing, <laughs> biggest um ever comeback in like NBA history or something like that. Like, I think that's like where the highest scoring quarter ever. We had some like 54 point quarter in, in sure. Toronto or something. Tim Hardaway jr. Was like scorching hot, whatever. This, oh, I remember that. Now. Yeah. Yes. Knicks. I do remember that. Game. The, I remember the that Knicks game. of my beloved youth or the Tim Hardaway jr. Knicks. Yeah, so no, that, that, that's what I, I remember that. Game. I remember that game. Well, they were hitting, they were hitting everything. everything. Game. Yeah. And a flalo was like, looked like clay Thompson. Yeah. So basically um, that, is what I think is like the holy shit moment of this year. It's like we're down to a team like uh, I don't know. That's that the, the, the NBA league just like they think runs the world. Like I, I, I maybe the um, Nuggets if they have a lot of wins early, and I think they are like a 55, 60, 50, 55, 58 win team this year. Denver, I think they're going to be really good. Okay, regular season uh, as always. So you know maybe they go up. 42 on us and Brunson and RJ are like no shot. This is happening right now. And we come back and win it, but I can't see some like big star trade happening. This front office needs patience. They're, they're waiting to pounce and everyone's like, Oh, but what are they going to, they, they need the patience. And I, I think the the biggest moment to come out of this season is a game that we'll never forget. Um, that was good. Uh, that was good. That was a good answer. It's a safe answer, oddly enough, because um, you're you're not putting you're not saying anything like, like a player is going to do um, on January seventh at four oh nine p.m. No, I are trading for Devin. You know I mean, <laughs> jeez, I don't is that think that what that you they, wanted. <laughs> that would be happening. a holy shit. Yeah, it's not happening. <laughs> we need a full year of Chris Paul aging, eight and situation going to shit operation armani is alive and well it's alive all right i'll i'll give you one um i think that they will make a win now trade not for a star player but i think 
they will make a win now trade in which they trade for a player who is on a team that is either currently tanking or intending on tanking or will pivot into a tank. And I think, you know, all anybody's been talking about the last week and change since the women Yana games is that there's going to be teams that pivot, right? And like everybody's already circling Charlotte and, you know, maybe Washington or, you know, whoever else. I I think, and there, and people are talking about how like, oh, which is why the Lakers should hold off and not do a rush trade now, because when one of these teams just want, just is trying to get worse to lose more games, that'll be the better trade, you know, and the Lakers will be able to get away with paying less. I look at the Knicks as a team that like, if you want to circle one team in the league, who's going to try to take advantage of the fact that there will be other teams trying to shirk out of the, a potential play in race. Um, I think the Knicks will be one to try to take advantage of that. And if they could solidify their position as like a seven seed or an eight seed, if something like that is on the table for them, I dare I say a six seed, I think they will do that. And I could see them trading. Maybe not a pick. If they if they're really it like maybe they trade away the 23 pick with like a young player, but they like heavily protect it um, with a young player and like Fournier's salary for like a for a, again, a win now veteran who is not again, not a star, but someone who will make them better. I think that'll be the holy shit moment. And I think it'll probably come out of nowhere. And love it. if we're if we're sticking with the track record of this front office. It'll be before any other teams. It maybe it's the trade that kicks off trade season. There's one that it'll the Knicks will make the trade that kicks off trade season. Well, there, Andrew, is. you got one. I've been racking my brain trying to think for one. I think my it's preseason, tough. my preseason one was already like is a holy shit take that I think the what? Knicks win 45 games. Oh, yeah, that'd be holy shit. Yeah, if the Knicks are it, so. No, I don't think I'm not going to spoil. I think, I think it's holy shit, but it's not like scorching. Like I love. I know, but you I depends like who you talk to. It, of it course. Is, well, out, <laughs> out of out of market. Oh, out of market. No, I'm shit. talking in market, Chris. There is many Nick, many a Nick fan that think the power right. forward of this team is worth the, negative. The worst, however, the worst person to ever walk the planet. Which ruined, look, we spent all off season trying to trade him. So I get it. Like we went around to other markets trying to find a trade partner. Guess what? Nobody wants them. They're in on the. They they have the access to cleaning the glass and NBA stats too. But um, I just, but the Wembenyama part of this is going to create a world where the Knicks are one of the teams actually trying there. I went on a pod with Dan for Valley and the point I made about the Knicks is like, if there's anything that you can count as they're going to try their very hardest to get to the middle. So that's to their detriment. Like some teams are going to try to get to the top very hard. Some teams are going to try to get to the bottom very hard. And I think the Knicks will try their darndest to be like the seventh seed is ours. You know, I agree with that. Yeah. I think they will go. Well, I don't think they will compromise. Let me, I'll end with this. I think the Knicks based on probably their discussions with the jazz this summer, probably have their own internal evaluations that maybe have been recalibrated slightly on what their best assets are. I don't think they will touch any of those, but I think that they, I could see them making a move that they trade away something or someone that other people that, you know, fans deem is a top asset um, in a move that does not bring them a star. And I could see that potentially upsetting some people. So, yeah. Well, this was good. That was your last question, sir. Um, I hope we did okay. Eh. What are you asking? You asking, you asking mom? Uh, Not your best. Uh, you, you guys have done better. <laughs> Just, uh, you know. I'm trying to think before we let Chris go, should we ask him? Should we ask him one something else? It's funny. Um, I asked him, we were talking before because as soon as we get done recorded, I'm headed to see the, the new Halloween movie. And I was asking Chris about his favorite horror movies. And then oh, yeah. I found out there's not very many that he's seen. Although you've seen The Exorcist. So that was actually like, oh, well, 
Uh, that's, yeah, that's, look at look at me go. Yeah. I was surprised. Yeah. Wow, you I'll see, ask. I'll surprised. ask. I'll ask Chris this question: In what film franchise? Now, what film franchise d- does uh, takes place at Camp Crystal Lake? Oh, get the hell out of here! Um, um, today is the, what day of the week? Is what uh, day of the month, Chris? Friday the third. Friday the thirteenth. It's Thursday the thirteenth right now, but Friday the thirteenth is Crystal Camp Crystal Lake. Good. Thanks for the the tip. I was gonna You're say welcome. my movie tidbit was gonna be in the last year. <laughs> what I've added to the list, uh, American Psychos. Uh, I've seen. That's great. So that's you know. In what film franchise did the main characters often have nightmares on Elm Street? Nope. <laughs> Elm Street. What, 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 what are we doing here, man? Elm Street. Oh, that's great. Are you wearing that to the theater? If it, for anybody who's listening to. on the podcast, Andrew just went and got a Mike Myers mask. I don't know. More people this are strapped is such, in like, America, so I don't want to scare nope, anybody. Nobody has camaraderie like us at KFS. Like, like Andrew's going as John for Halloween. Uh, that's great. That's good. I did just no get a haircut. Does, no one does it like us. Um, this was fun. I'm done talking to you, Chris. Uh, <laughs> thank you for doing this, as always. My, thank my, you for my, my mic's been cut. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Jesus, Andrew just took off the mask. And it's and Andrew, Andrew just suffocated himself, is what Andrew Ooh. just did. <laughs> you know, sometimes you're walking around one of those pop up Halloween shops and you're like, oh, this is a good investment. <laughs> and then it's just sitting there for 364 days. <laughs> and you're like, you know, no, we should call, it you know we should call that mask. We should call that mask Cam Reddish. There you go. Oh, shit. Oh. And on that note, <laughs> see ya. Why she comes out as a great fucking game on Friday night. I hope he does after see that. Ya. And he says it's this podcast that won't leave me alone and compared me to an old Listen, man. Up Michael Myers mask. Whatever gets it done. Uh, All right. Thank you, uh, Andrew. Uh, Thank you, Chris. And thank you, listeners, for checking out another episode of Thanks Film School Podcast. We're a sham. I say it every time we come on. Uh, We'll be back with uh, post-game edition of the pod after the the Knicks play the Wizards on Friday night. And then uh, we will have, uh, you know, our usual usual pods going on from there. All right. uh, Talk to everybody soon. Peace out. Chris, can I ask you, like, quiz you on? I'll say the the villain, and you say the franchise. Go ahead. Ghostface. Wu Tag. <laughs> That's a great answer. It's That's wrong. Your generation. It's a great Ghostface. answer. It's really not though. Chris was born four years before, four, five years after the first movie came out. There was a movie in the franchise came out this year though. Scream. Oh, I, yeah. dude, Ghost I Faces like, Scream. I was like, Top Gun? I was like, <laughs> oh, gosh, no. Um, I just <laughs> said it. Michael Myers. Friday. The no, Michael Myers is the guy with the mask. Halloween. 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 And then Freddy. Uh, Fred, uh, no, Jason Voorhees. That one. Friday the 13th. Friday. That's, yes. That I knew is Friday. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Freddy Krueger. <laughs> oh, that, I know the name. And people have been him for Halloween. And he's got like the... The orange scarecrow look, but I don't know the movie. Yes, because he got burnt. So the his origin story is that he was uh, like left in a house to burn to death, and he survived. And now he comes back and haunts people in their dreams. Or didn't even survive. He just haunts uh, people in their dreams. So his skin is burnt. Is what he is. He's a burner. Yeah, I, it's like the skeleton looking like scarecrow dressed guy. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And he he kills you in your dreams, so that makes him even more scary. Uh, Leatherface. Once again, know it, but not the movie. Like I know. That. That's the sound uh, of a chainsaw. Yeah, yeah, right? a chainsaw. Um, in in. Uh, I thought I gave it away. The Texas Chainsaw Massacre. <laughs> There's a movie called The Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Oh, wow. that that's 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 the first wow that you gave me today. That's so funny. <laughs>